So we were discussing transport mechanisms, and I've gone through all of the passive transport, um, and now we're looking at active transport mechanisms across the United States. So active transport, active just simply refers to the fact that we're going to require an energy supply to make this transport happen. So when we discuss active transport, we typically will say that the solutes are pumped. I'll put that in parentheses. They're going to be pumped against their concentration gradient. So it requires energy because we're going to get some pervading force, in this case, the concentration gradient. Um, you know, just like uh, water, if we pump water to another location, we may be going against the gravitational gradient, and so we're going to use pump, a pump that requires energy, some sort of electrical supply or something like that to move it against that pervading force. We're doing the same thing here. Concentration gradient, remember, molecules always want to travel down their concentration gradient. We're not going against that. And so we have to input that force, and we're going to pump the solutes against the concentration gradient. Because we're going against that concentration gradient, we're using the pump mechanism. This is going to require energy. Typically, the energy is going to be supplied by ATP, and it's going to be a hydrolysis reaction. So we'll use water to break the ATP. We're breaking that third phosphate bond between the second and third phosphate groups. It's a high energy bond. When it breaks, a little bit of heat is released, a little bit of energy is available to do work. We end up with an ADP and an inorganic phosphate afterwards, but our molecule that we're applying the work to, in this case, the protein channel, is probably going to have some sort of change that occurs in response to that hydrolysis reaction. Frequently, active transport is used to form what are known as electrical, electrochemical gradients. Sometimes also referred to as a membrane potential. Now the term potential, you need to really begin to think in terms of batteries and electrical sources. The quantity that we use to measure a potential is voltage. Okay? So you've all probably put a battery in something before. And it might have been a AA battery, which is a 1.5 volt battery. That means it has a 1.5 volt potential. And that's really a description of the amount of work that that battery can do for you, the amount of uh, energy that can be supplied. And it's actually an electrical, electrochemical gradient. So inside of a battery, just to kind of give you a little example here, if this is my battery, it should look relatively familiar, usually what you have is your positive electrode that extends down, it kind of looks like a pin, and then it's wrapped up in a paper barrier, and there's some other type of chemical here, and then we have another chemical here on the negative side. Okay? And so there's a barrier, and we can either go through the barrier, but it's an impermeable barrier, so we can't, so we have to go around it. When we go around it, that voltage will generate a current. The current is actually a description of the work that is being done. The current is what's going to drive a light bulb, or it's going to drive whatever the mechanical device is that that battery is in. So the 1.5 volt potential is a description of a difference of the charged ion that's in this part of the battery versus the charged ion that's in this part of the battery. And the electrons are what are actually being exchanged. So you've heard of things like nickel cadmium. You have nickel on one side, and you have cadmium on the other. Nickel gives up its electron and passes it off to the cadmium. Can't get the electrons can't go through that barrier. They have to go around the barrier. And when they go around it, if you put some sort of device here, like a little kid's toy or a flashlight, generates current that causes work to occur. Okay? Our membranes in biology can do the same thing. Except they're going to be a semi-permeable 
fact, I'm sorry, a selectively permeable membrane. Well, that was a real slip there. Selectively permeable membrane, which means that we're going to pass our charged particle through the membrane. Now, it's not typically electron, but occasionally there might be some electrons here that get moved around. But normally, the particle is a charged particle of potassium or sodium, or what we would call an ion. And the whole atom moves, or the whole molecule moves across the membrane. Okay? So we're going to use these pumps to basically maintain the membrane having its charge. I want to maintain a bunch of sodium outside, a little sodium inside. And so I'm moving the sodium out of the inside of the cell, constantly moving it back out to make sure that the membrane is fully charged every time that I want to use it to generate some sort of work. So we're going to form these electrochemi electrochemical gradients or membrane potentials. And we're going to do this by pumping our charged particles or our ions across the membrane. And when we do this, the membrane forms a sidedness. Just like in this example, this barrier here, this is an impermeable barrier, it has a sidedness. It has a positive side and it has a negative side. In our biological system, we're going to have a positive side and we're going to have a negative side. Now, notice that I have not just nickel and cadmium, but I have things like potassium and large anions and sodium mixed up in both of my locations. The concentration of those charged particles becomes different. And that's where the membrane potential actually arises out of because I get a sidedness, plus and minus sides around the membrane because there's more sodium out here, less sodium in here. More large anions out here, very few, if any, large anions out here creating the sidedness. Okay? The reason that we want to have electrochemical gradients, just like that battery, the energy can then be stored in that electrochemical gradient. Remember that these membranes, they're not totally perfect. They're selective, and they can choose when large amounts of specific ions are going to cross using their mosaic proteins that are popped into the membrane, but they're not perfect. They're actually a little bit leaky. So sodium actually will cross directly through the membrane at a very low rate, but if we don't counter that uh, leakiness, then we're going to begin to drain that membrane's charge, right? If I have a bunch of positives that go from this side into this side, what happens over here? Less positive, and over here becomes more positive. And the positiveness and negativeness begins to equalize. And just like in our battery example, when that happens, we say, oh, the battery is dead. So we want to make sure that we maintain a disequilibrium of charge and a disequilibrium of certain ions on either side of the membrane. So as the sodium leaks in, we pump it back out. Potassium is higher inside, which is positive, but remember everything is overall negative here because we have things like DNA and acids and proteins that don't cross the membrane because they're just too big that have a negative charge. So the inside of the cell should always be negative at rest. Potassium will leak out of the membrane, and so I want to bring it back in. And so I use this pump, pumping sodium against its concentration gradient, potassium against its concentration gradient, burning an ATP every time I do that to help maintain the right number of sodium molecules out here in the extracellular fluid, the right amount of potassium molecules here in the intercellular fluid, so that I have a charged membrane, a sided membrane, positive and negative side at all times, so that I can use it for work. Okay, so that was active transport. Typically, if you hear the word pump, like a sodium-potassium pump, the 
which is shown there, you know that it's active transport because it's a pump, and you know that it's moving sodium and potassium because it's a sodium potassium pump. The next, the next mechanism of transport is called co-transport. Co-transport can also be called secondary active transport. Co-transport or secondary active transport is basically a hybrid version of facilitated diffusion and active transport. So I have facilitated diffusion, I have a facilitated diffusion mechanism, and I have an active transport mechanism. So the example that you can see here, I'm going to have a proton pump moving hydrogen proton from a low concentration to a high concentration. And then that hydrogen pump that creates the concentration gradient or maintains the concentration gradient that we can also call electro electrochemical gradient, that hydrogen passes through another facilitated diffusion protein down its concentration gradient. And when it does, the energy from moving the concentration down the concentration gradient can be used to facilitate the movement of a larger molecule like sucrose across the membrane. So I have my active mechanism here. I have my facilitated diffusion mechanism here. I pump out a proton against its concentration gradient, spending a little bit of ATP. And then the concentration gradient that's created, high concentration here, low concentration here, allows that hydrogen to diffuse down its concentration gradient. And the energy of diffusion in this particular facilitated diffusion protein allows sucrose or oil to enlarge molecules across the membrane. I need to spend basically an ATP molecule to make it happen. Whereas if I was trying to move sucrose across directly, I would require more energy. So it's our hybrid between facilitated diffusion, active transport, and we are going to pump something against its concentration gradient to maintain and establish that concentration gradient. So it doesn't always have to be hydrogen, it can be other uh, molecules as well, sodium, potassium, it can be used to do this. Once we've created that concentration gradient, then a second protein acts through a facilitated diffusion mechanism and moves down its concentration gradient. And that movement from high concentration to low concentration across the membrane allows that diffusing molecule to pull on another molecule. So it pulls something else. And a lot of times, it's either going to be a really big molecule like sucrose, or it's going to be pulling a molecule against its concentration. So up to this point, passive diffusion, active diffusion, co-transport, or secondary active uh, uh, transport, all of these mechanisms work on typically just one molecule at a time. The pump, where we move three sodiums and two potassiums, is a little bit of a um, uh, differentiation of, of that definition. But really, we're still looking at just moving a single molecule or a very small number of molecules across the membrane through a pump or a, a co-transport facilitated diffusion bed mechanism or even right directly through the membrane itself. So we're dealing with just, let's call it for now, for simplicity, say, one molecule. But we actually can move large amounts of material across the membrane at one time as well. Just like in the shipping world, that's called bulk transport or bulk delivery.
So bulk transport. This is going to involve large amounts of material being moved across the membrane all at one time. And I want you to be familiar with four different bulk transport, uh, four different types of bulk transport across the membrane, and one type of bulk transport through the cell itself. Okay. So again, bulk transport. We're going to move lots of stuff at one time. So it's not just a single ion in this case, like what we had with active transport. It's a whole bunch of stuff all at one time. We can move across the membrane in two different ways, into the cell or out of the cell. When we move stuff across the membrane out of the cell, we call that exo cytosis. Exocytosis is out of the cell. And that's one of our forms of bulk transport. Now, just maybe to help you remember some of this stuff, the term exocytosis, exocytosis, I see exit in there. So we exit cytosis. And that's because we're exiting the cell or we're leaving the cell. The next category would be to bring stuff into the cell. In general terms, we call that endocytosis. There's going to be three specific types of endocytosis that I'd like you to be familiar with. So endocytosis, I see it there. Into cytosis. So into the cell with endocytosis. Three types. And the three types are going to be based off of what is being brought in, the material that's being brought in. The first type is when we have solid particles. And we form this invagination where we go up with the cell membrane and we grab onto a bunch of solid material and pull it in. The Latin for eating is phago. So we're eating solid food here, the cell is, and so we're going to call that phagocytosis. You eat solid food, the cell through phagocytosis pulls in solid material. What you're looking at here is rather than it being a bunch of solid particles, you have individual particles dissolved into a solution. And so this is more like a drink, like Gatorade is a solution, right? Because it contains all the sugar inside of its watery material. The Latin for drinking is pino. And so pinocytosis is going to be the idea that you cell pulls in solution and not solid material. Cell drinking is literally what pinocytosis is. So movement of material in a solution form rather than a solid. Now the very last form over here is receptor mediated endocytosis. Receptor mediated endocytosis. It's a slightly different uh, type of transport here. Basically what happens is the cell determines that it needs a specific type of material. So maybe it's glucose. And what happens is that cell is genetically programmed or reprogrammed to produce a protein that can bind onto glucose. That receptor gets put up into the membrane and then gets exposed to the extracellular environment. Then glucose passes by and it attaches onto those receptors. Those receptors all get loaded up, and then that membrane, piece of membrane of all those receptors, it goes through that invagination, it blends into the cell as a coated vesicle. And so it's a packet that contains receptors holding onto that specific molecule that gets pulled in that way. So all of these are across the cell membrane. Endocytosis and exocytosis, there are three types of endocytosis, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. 
all deal with moving stuff across the membrane. But once we get a packet of material, which you can see we have packets of material um, for both endocytosis and then here exocytosis as we deliver stuff out of the cell, we have to move and traffic those packets around the cell. And we use a form of transport called transcytosis. And basically those packets get moved along the filamentous cytoskeleton inside of the cell and get walked along by other proteins that move those packets to where they need to be within the cell. So maybe it needs to be delivered to the endoplasmic particular or the Golgi complex. That packet will get trafficked specifically to those locations in the cell. So transcytosis is going to be through the cell and not across the membrane as the other two forms of transport. Right, any questions? We're about to move on. Transcytosis is just simply moving those packets of material around the cell, not through the membrane. So we're about to start some material in chapter 8, which is the chapter that deals with metabolism. So go ahead and start a new set of notes if you want to call it something. Go ahead and call it metabolism. So the area of biology and chemistry that we're about to engage on is known as bioenergetics. And the science of bioenergetics really deals with the organism's mechanism of energy management. So we're going to study the organism's management of energy. Or you could say how the organism deals with its energy requirements. Inside of any living system, whether it's a individual cell from an individual single cell organism or many cells inside of a multicellular organism or just one even just one cell inside of that multicellular organism the collection of all of the chemical processes in the cell or in the organism is what we would refer to as metabolism so bioenergetics is really the study of metabolism because metabolism is all of the chemical energies that are occurring inside of the cell that are managing the energy and chemical nature of that particular organism. Here is a tiny little fraction of the chemical processes occurring inside of the cell. And if you're a little bit familiar with some of the things here, you might actually uh, begin to see some things that look relatively familiar. Um, things like glucose being converted into glucose 6-phosphate, all the way down until we have things like acetyl-CoA going through this cyclical process of acetyl CoA combined with oxalic acid to produce citric acid. That will be glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, producing NADHs so that we can pass those into the electron transport chain. And those are all chemical processes that help to deal with the energy needs of the organism. You'll see other things in here, like amino acids being converted into other amino acids or fatty acids being utilized as a source for acetyl-CoA for energy production. So all of these different chemical processes occurring inside of the cell will be referred to as the metabolism of that particular cell. Uh, I used to have posters on my wall when I was a PhD student that had all of the known chemical reactions that occurred inside of the cell. There were two posters, and they, one, of, one of them was as big as the, as the smart one. And the writing was about 10.5 inches, I mean it was just a tiny. And if you were kind of familiar, you could look back and you can see 
the glycolytic pathway and you can see the Krebs cycle as a circle. But there was literally thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of these chemical reactions all occurring inside of individual cells. My biochemistry course as a PhD student, he brought in butcher paper and he told me right down three chemical reaction. <laughs> So the point is, metabolism is really, really extensive and it's really, really complex. But because of some really basic understanding of chemistry with hydrolysis reactions, dehydration reactions, you're going to be able to really understand a lot of what's going on in the chemistry of metabolism. So here are a bunch of different medical uh, metabolic processes. And what you're really looking at there is a way for a cell to organize and to maintain substances so that we have ready available pools for protein synthesis or for ATP production or to handle nitrogenous waste and other waste products. So we have all of these substances and we're going to manage them, we're going to maintain them so the cell can function as a living system. Now metabolism, typically we break it up into two uh, kind of subcategories. And those two subcategories are going to be catabolic processes and anabolic processes. So Catabolic or catabolism are all of the different chemical reactions that are involved in the breakdown of compounds. That's not supposed to be. So we use catabolic processes to form energy. And you can kind of think of this as being a dance between catabolism and anabolism. So we're going to use food molecules that come in from your diet that have energy associated with those food molecules. And we're going to oxidize those food molecules. That's catabolism. And as we do that, we generate energy. So we get energy converted into a new, a new form. And we can truck that around the cell, move it to other locations to be used to take protein and put it together, or to take glucose and put it into glycogen. And so we can build molecules on the other side using anabolism from the energy that we got from our catabolic processes. Um, so not to jump here away from uh, catabolism just yet, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to anabolism here in just a second. The two main forms of an, uh, catabolic processes that we're going to have inside of a cell are going to be respiration and fermentation. And you can think of respiration and fermentation as being with oxygen respiration and without oxygen fermentation. So the other side of the equation here, catabolic processes pull the energy from foodstuffs. Anabolic processes are going to use that energy to build things up. That's why we take anabolic steroids, because we want to build muscle, we want to build up our muscle mass. So anabolism or anabolic is to assemble compounds. Catabolic is going to form usable energy. Anabolic is going to use the energy. One of the big things that we do in a biological system is to build proteins or undergo what's called protein synthesis. And it's not just about 
increasing muscle mass, right? Protein synthesis is dealing with those ATP pumps or those uh, proton pumps that we've already looked at for, for transport. It's to create those proteins that can go in and do functional work. Because really, what is it coming out to? Proteins for physiology. So we have to be able to produce proteins in order to have biological um, biological processes occur. So again, between metabolism and animalism, this is a dance where energy is released, which we would call metabolism. And that energy that's released is what fuels the energy need of the cell, which is the build stuff, which is animalism. This whole idea of connecting catabolism to animalism, using catabolic processes to pull energy out to a usable form, and using that created energy to build molecules, that's called energy coupling. So we couple our two energy sources, our breakdown of energy in catabolism to our buildup of energy in anabolism. Notice also that this is energetically favorable in a biological system. But anabolism is not energetically favorable. We don't need energy here. We're actually using energy here, releasing the energy so that it can be used here in that energetically unfavorable reaction. It's not favorable to build a protein. We have to build a protein because that's what is required for physiology, but we're going to need to put energy into that process, the creation process of the protein. So what exactly is energy? We've talked a little bit about energy. Now let's really put down a definition for energy. The definition that I'm going to work from, energy is going to be the capacity to do work. The capacity to do work. And there are a bunch of different types of work that you can run and do in biology. Things like um, causing the light to turn on which may be uh, is involved in um, the illumination of the reality of the environment. We use a protein called luciferase that breaks down a molecule called luciferol. And when luciferol is broken apart, not only does it create a little bit of heat, it also creates a little bit of light. And so we're using this idea of work to create that chemical reaction in a favorable environment so that we have the of the light the fireflies. Uh, the work may be chemical. It may be taking glucose and converting it into ATP. All of these are examples of work. They are what we are trying to accomplish. The work is what we're trying to accomplish through the breakdown of our energy. You may refer to work as simply the ability to move against an opposing force, which in some concepts is pretty easy. You all know that it needs a little bit, you need a little bit of work to climb the stairs, right? But in that abdomen of a butterfly, you're opposing work. You're opposing the fact that that reaction doesn't really want to happen. You don't want to break luciferol down to generate light, but it becomes a really good way to cause predators to miss and flash air and continue flying and the predator aims for that location. Okay. It's all flashing. So we're moving against some of the opposing force or some opposition. Now there are two types of energy. And we've already briefly touched on these types of energy when we we're discussing locations of electrons around chemical bonds. Does anyone have to remember what those two types of energy were? 
kinetic and potential energy. So kinetic energy is just simply going to be that energy that's involved in movement or in motion. So when the electron moves from one energy cell shell to another energy shell, as it moves, that's kinetic energy. The shell itself is going to be our second type of energy, which is potential energy. On a gross biological set scale, when you go to leave here and start walking, you're using kinetic energy generated by your muscle tissue. Potential energy, on the other, other hand, is going to hold a capacity hold the capacity to do work. Now again, what is the key to understanding potential energy? Got up on the table, I changed my position. Changes the potential energy getting up. I'm putting a little bit of kinetic energy to go from the lower energy state to the higher energy state that's going to be on top of the table. So our potential energy, we're going to have to keep track of our location. Do you not remember this conversation a couple of weeks ago? It's like, I got on the table. Did I not? I made it. I mean, got it. I did. So our potential energy is going to be location dependent, and in terms of the chemical energy inside of a cell, it really comes down to the electron's position and how it's located in an atom and in a bonding relationship. Okay, so that really is the definition of chemical energy is going to be the position of electrons. So let's say that I need a little bit of energy. So I probably want to reorganize an electron from a high energy shell to a lower energy shell. One of the ways for us to reorganize the position of an electron is to under have that electron be involved in a chemical reaction. And so maybe I'm going to take a molecule um, like acetyl-CoA and I'm going to chemically react it with oxaloacetate to generate a molecule called citric acid. I've now reorganized some of the electrons between the oxaloacetate and the acetyl-CoA to form a new molecule. Because those electrons are now in different positions, they're in different electron shells in their new bond relationships, I've reorganized the position, reorganized potential energy, the difference between two different potential energy states on the floor versus up on the table means a difference in kinetic energy. So really what the cell has to do is it has to change the electrons or the chemical energy. When energy changes form, we can extract ability to do work from those changes in form. So an organism, you and I are a single cell bacteria, Simply put, we are energy transformers. You eat food, your cells chemically alter that food, reorganizing positions of electrons within new bonding relationships, releasing energy, allowing you to produce proteins or maintain proteins so that you can go out your daily function. We do need an ultimate energy source for all of this to work. Anyone have to know what that is? Yeah, it's going to be UV light. 
that we most frequently are going to get from sunlight. Now I say most frequently because obviously there are some places where they generate UV lights for UV light for plants inside greenhouses and things like that. And ultimately it all still comes from the sun anyways. And so the sunlight as it comes down, little packets called photons interact with plants and photosynthetic uh, organisms that contain what's called chloroplasts. And inside of the chloroplast, that sunlight takes that photon of energy, runs it through something called photosynthesis, which begins to generate molecules of glucose. And we're going to talk about that whole chemical cycle at some point. So from the sun, as it interacts with chloroplasts, we reorganize electrons based off of that sunlight energy to generate molecules that now are holders of energy because of repositioned electrons. By the way, this process of using a packet of light called a photon to reorganize electrons to generate a new molecule of glucose is a form of kinetic energy. And we're using a chloroplast to make glucose. And in a lot of cases, that glucose eventually gets all strapped together through one six carbon bonds, or maybe one four carbon bonds as well, uh, and then we form starch and we'll pack it in amyloids. And then you go and you eat it, and you can gain that energy out of it. So the sunlight to the chloroplast is an example of kinetic energy. I'm using that light energy, transforming it into chemical energy as I produce the glucose. Then the chloroplast making the glucose and putting the glucose into starch, that starch becomes my potential energy. Or at least my storage location of potential energy. And then you and I eat that potato today, this afternoon at lunch, and we begin to rearrange those glucose molecules. We pull them out of the starch. We send them through the glycolytic pathway. All along the way, we're reorganizing the bonds, reorganizing the electrons. Those extra electrons go to new energy shells, and we're gaining the energy that's been packaged into it. And that's an example of back to kinetic energy. So there's a whole bunch of energy that's being moved around and being transformed. We call that thermodynamics. So thermodynamics is the idea or the part of bioenergetics that deals with energy regulation. There is a set of rules that energy has to play by. Right? There are laws in nature, and those laws define how nature will function. So when we begin to first assess thermodynamics, we have to admit that the rules are going to apply to a specific system. And within that system, you are going to have matter transforming energy. And that matter transforming energy is going to be held up in organisms. Okay? So you have matter that holds potential energy that's going to be transformed to release some of that energy to perform work. In that system, all of this is happening. So we're going to call the system an organism. So you are a system. You are a system. And I am a system within this context of thermodynamics. And we exist within a surroundings called an environment. Okay. 
in our sort of uh, surroundings or our environment is basically where we interact. Okay? So the system or the organism is set in the context of the environment. And we are continually interacting with the environment, extracting resources from the environment, depositing waste into the environment. And we can follow two different mechanisms. And these are going to be mutually exclusive. The system can either be an open system, which means that we readily exchange material. energy and matter with the environment or the surroundings, which is what we do. So we are all considered open systems. You go and eat the potato, you pull that potato in from the environment. You go home and do your business tonight. You're releasing your waste back into the environment. Then we have a closed system. And that closed systems, that closed system approach means that we don't have an exchange. With the environment. So no energy or matter is exchanged with the environment. Obviously in biological world, pretty much everything you deal with is an open system. The organism interacts with its surroundings. When we get up to the closed system, we might be looking at the whole universe or the whole cosmos as a closed system. The cosmos itself is not interacting with anything outside of itself. It's not a system within an environment. We obviously can experimentally induce environmental syst or, uh, closed systems within our environment. Um, I could take one of you and I could put you in a chamber and seal you off and give you everything you need to, to live. Or just to change your entire department. Figure it out on your own. So thermodynamics is this idea that we have energy systems that are regulated that contain an organism and surroundings or an environment. The rules that we play by, I'm just going to introduce this here. These are all classified as law which means that every time it happens, it happens this way. Not a theory or a hypothesis, it's a law. And you really have three laws of thermodynamics, but because this is biology, not chemistry, I only need you to know about two of them. So when we get back here on Wednesday, we'll pick up with the first law of thermodynamics. Which just says here, Cleaning up, first law can basically be summarized as energy and matter are conserved. 